great pleasure today to have Catherine Bergner from Rico Innovations giving the talk. Um, Catherine uh, did her PhD in mathematics in Bremen, in Germany, and then she did her postdoc with Rich Baroner at Rice with a um, group of digital signal processing. And then she joined RICO at uh, the end of 90s, right? Mm -hmm. And now there she's a research manager and she leads a group uh, on, on digital optics. And uh, two other members of the group, uh, Prasanna and Sapna, are here and they're the co authors um, on the, of this talk. And uh, Catherine will talk about multi aperture computational imaging systems. So it's a great pleasure to have you. So when I thought about putting this uh, talk together, I know that there are some kind of interest in signal processing more and then some of the vision part. And so I try to put something together that is something for everybody. And but also show a little bit where we think our expertise is so you have to learn a little bit about what we are doing and where, where we think our strengths comes into this kind of joint imaging space. And please uh, feel free to interrupt wherever you have questions, so we can just do it very interactively. And this is work uh, that uh, Prasanna and Sapna have been doing together with me. So uh, if you have some very specific technical questions, there's the right people to bounce off a lot of that stuff as well. So I thought I'd start with a little bit intro, a very, very short intro into Rico Innovations because most people don't know about us. And then I talk about some of the buzzwords that are in the title. So there are titles, multi-aperture, there's computational imaging system design. So I will give a very quick glance what I think computational imaging is, and then give an example of in two different system designs that both have to do with multiple views, multiple apertures, how we actually apply this framework and how we think we can get performance improvement out of these systems. Then there are open questions. It's always interesting. What comes next? What have we not solved? And we also started a little bit uh, looking into stereoscopic 3D, which is kind of a, from the capture side, a two-view problem <laughs> at the moment. But of course, there's a lot on the um, perceived quality and visual processing side that we st just started to get into to explore. Um, so where we are, uh, so we are a research lab that belongs to big company RICO, and RICO is centered in uh, Tokyo area, headquartered in Japan, and we are on purpose away from the Japan, across the ocean, across different cultures in Silicon Valley, to lead RICO's future through innovation. And so we have to utilize Silicon Valley tech trends, the people in companies and r research institutions in the Bay Area, and the business development opportunities, new business uh, model trends we see, etc. So we filter all this back to the main company and have quite of influence over the years. So here's something that is very, fast in the, very far in the past. Oh, many people today know Rico about their printer uh, products and MFPs, multifunction printers that are usually these copiers that are in the hallway. And in the past, we fed a lot of signal processing technology into the products. We were originating the JPEG 2000 standard, the image compression standard came out of our lab. We were uh, leading the standardization effort for many, many years. We did wavelet-based processing, which to our knowledge, the first wavelet-based enhancement in commercial products. It was 2005 in all the big Rico copiers you can see on the hallway. We push the green button, it does wavelet-based denoising and enhancement in it. Um, we did other image compression techniques that went into various products that were very specific for this product, lossless, lossy compression. We also did some kind of expert system that was kind of more the solution type of thing, software solutions. We did also some other uh, solutions. This was a startup that we made out of our lab more than 10 years ago. It was the first appliance for Rico. Instead of being a multifunction thing where everything was buried, a lot of functions to one machine, it was one thing that could do one thing particularly well. It was an electronic file storage cabinet shoebox that captures everything that you printed, faxed, emailed, etc., and you can retrieve it later. So that was a product here. It got folded back into Rico's mainline, and I think now it kind of disappeared. This is up to me as a more recent one that lets you customize workflow around printers and copiers, etc. So that is all kind of the old world Rico that people might know from the printing and copier time. So, and then we did a lot of new things that we want to go away from printers and copiers in our lab. And we had problems getting it into Rico products because Rico was not ready to move away from paper for a long time. But over the last few years, they actually have, and that was harvest time for us. So our technologies are now into different productization stages. One is you see an enterprise tablet here that uh, we spin out of our lab. It's in San Jose, a, a group. And it is announced in press conferences, and uh, they're a little bit delayed with shipping. They were supposed to already ship, I think that will be end of September, maybe. 
That is a specific tablet that has e-ink display, like the Kindle. It has our technology for very fast paced fribbing, very smooth writing, uh, certain security issues, and easy upload to a central service. This is a workflow solution. So insurance agents, some medical forms that you have to fill out, you fill out with very native handwriting, push the button, it uploads it, very low power. So that you will see on the market very soon. We have some other stuff. On the right side, you see Rico Visual Search. That was one of our projects that had to do with mobile computing. Everybody has smartphones these days. Visual Search is you take a picture of certain scene, object, whatever it is. It recognizes certain features, access a database, and get additional features delivered to you. So that is very mature technology that we're trying to uh, uh, commercialize at the moment. We have a document workflow type of things from the phone. So you can take, instead of a scanner, these days people don't use scanner anymore. They just use their phone and take pictures. You take picture of your poster that you see at a conference or some other things. And so there's a technology that connects it automatically to the cloud and does some more processing on it, like cleaning up the image to remove some of the noise and the shading effect, etc. So that you find also on our website. These apps you can download. They're running on some iPhone, some Android. And so what our group has been done, uh, focusing in the past, is what we saw computational imaging system design. That means take uh, advantage of very detailed knowledge of the objects, but also on the image processing and design the system in a joint way. And I will talk a little bit more what this design framework means. So this is now kind of in the harvesting state, this technology, very mature, somewhere in development state, startup phase. And we are resetting directions with our new CEO that came a few months ago. We're resetting directions to figure out what is the next big leap we have to make for RICO. So what, what do we want to be RICO in seven years? And so this is kind of our high-level uh, mission to uh, develop technologies around the infinite network that everything is connected. And uh, somehow this stuff feeds already into this mission, of course. So we have a paper, less paper type things that are connected to the cloud. We have uh, indexing with phone. We have a lot of mobile phone stuff, and we have optical sensors developed here that will feed into this entire network as well. We have other sensors too, re research and other sensors is starting that are not optical sensors, um, that are more like RFID-related technologies. Um, so that is what, what uh, short into, into RICO innovations, what we're doing today and for the next coming years. So now I want to go on to explain what I think computational imaging is or how we like to see it has been a buzzword for some time. Um, I like to see it this way. Traditional design of imaging system that says cameras is done by you know, looking at three blocks independently. We have optics, we have sensors, and we have digital processing. And each of these blocks is designed in usually different parts of a company, different groups, they're optics specialists, and then they send it to some sensor specialist, and then you get the sensor data and do some digital processing. So very sequential process. So your input might be some kind of scene or like a cell for a microscope or even some kind of uh, scene that you have some kind of depth information here. And your output might be any one of this. It might be a nice picture. It might be some just classification performance of your cell count here. Or it might be a depth map. But you know, this output is really not fed into design of the optics and the sensor. So because everything is sequential, you do as best as you can in each of the block. And at the end, you, you have some kind of multipurpose design that you try to get these different outputs from. So it's hardware components plus different coding techniques. So computational imaging, it started in the early 90s and got a big buzz some years ago with EDOF solutions, extended depth of field, that had all their own problems. But basically it tries to break the barriers between these different components and design them in a very joint framework. And I like to see it as a not individual encoding and the end decoding, but a transcoding of information. So be very clear of what your input is, what you are really after at the end, and then design your system accordingly. And with this uh, design framework, um, you actually can get certain benefits, certain performances that you thought be were not possible before, or certain form factors that were not possible before, or certain types of flexi flexibility that was not possible before. And I will show you examples of the, in the two uh, technologies I will present to you. Important thing is we have to change the way we measure performance, because we have to measure at this very end, but we have to measure all these different components. That means we have to measure optical plus kind of Digital signal processing like, means information theoretic performances. We have to combine all of them into cost metrics. And that's an interesting play, playground, I think. 
So now, quick into multi-aperture. So why are we interested in multi-apertures, multi basically multi-view? The increasing sensor capabilities. This, the sensors are so powerful these days, and all the sensor makers say, give us some better way to market our sensors than 15 megapixel or 20 megapixel, because uh, nobody wants to look at this high megapixel normal photos. We want to do something better with them. Digital processing, it's a little bit maybe uh, extreme position, but it's basically unlimited if you have enough electrical power. These predictions for chips uh, capabilities are enormous. In a few years, we will be de enormous computational powers on very small devices. And you know, something like 3D consumer technology, I brought this one here, but for the, you, maybe some of you played with this stuff. It's in everybody's hand now. We have a multi-view thing here. It's a stereo view. It's a kind of tool view. But people are actually using this and liking it. So uh, we see this all coming down into becoming reality to work with this multi-view systems. Where in the past, the first one looked maybe like this. You know, I think that was Stanford. They made this huge thing of multiple cameras and were carrying around and so So what we see today is what on that side there. We see very, very small multi-view systems that are system-on-the-chip solutions with very small micro-optics. And this is a camera uh, from Germany, some, and then this is a Pelican imaging that is, has a big of a buzz here in the Bay Area. So basically the dream is you have a sensor real estate and you put different things on it to capture different types of information and utilize the sensor capabilities this way. The question is, what do you put how do you design? How do you evaluate? How do you make a system work? So we have two examples, one for depth imaging and then one that has to do with the planoptic camera that we use for spectral imaging. And then I will give a little bit overview over what we did over the summer with our stereoscopic 3D in our office. So, me, yes. Sorry, I, I will come to this, okay. okay? So benefits for computational imaging system design in combination with multi-view. So in general, people say, oh, with computational imaging, you relax the design space, you have more degrees of freedom, you should be doing better. What does it mean? We actually can make these compact multi-view systems on a chip. So that means you can make a camera this big that has a variety of lenses or optical systems on it. Um, surpassing conventional performance limits, it is capable to capture different modalities of light on the sensor, not just a 2D normal photo, but also polarization, uh, dynamic range, spectral information, depth, all this stuff is possible. Um, we, I will show that we actually design systems that outperform stereo systems in terms of depth, accuracy, estimation by going from two to more lenses. And what we do is a lot of uh, simulation of these systems. Prototyping is really hard because there are so many degrees of freedom. You cannot make for every idea you have a new thing. It's, there's a lot of micro optics involved, a lot of bonding a lot of system design. So we work a lot on simulation and then optimizing of this very high dimensional parameter space. And real-time processing is really a challenge then. So, uh, so now we, first I go on the planoptic camera and I will give a quick review. This has, uh, came out of Stanford some years ago, Mark Levoy's group, and it basically says you take a regular lens and instead of focusing the lens on the detector, you move the detector a little bit away and put a microlens array in there. Microlens array is an array of tiny, tiny lenses. We're talking about a 100 micron diameter of these tiny lenses. Single lens elements, so very kind of simplistic lenses. But you can actually get different effects from putting this microlens there. And one of that got the biggest buzz was called digital refocusing. So what happens here, you can actually capture different angles of the rays in different sensor locations, where in the old architecture you integrate it all into one sensor pixel. And by having the different directions, you can figure out the basic depth information, the scene, and use that for changing focus. So there's always this crayon image here. We focus in the back, and then we focus in the middle, in the front. You can do all this with one data capture. You capture data once and then do digital mod modification of this data. So we see Ren Ang startup here in the Bay Area, and there's a company in Germany that tries to do camera it's this way. These micro lenses are not adjustable, they're fixed. No, they're fixed. They're fixed, yes. And usually, because of manufacturing constraints, they're all the same type of lenses. So they're sitting on an array. And, uh, what is the rough range depth of field for that? It depends on your really on the lens lead and all, on all kinds of parameters, how much sensor pixels you have. And so, so basically, big or basically small? Huh? No, I think decent. It's not small. So you see Rand's picture where the people stack up in the middle. So that is a few meters. 
but he has a huge sensor. So it really depends on a lot of these parameters. So we, uh, there was uh, recently some other work around the plane optic camera that says don't use it only for this refocusing, use it for spectral imaging. And that goes in the following way. So you, you put a filter module here into the main lens. Traditionally, a filter for normal uh, photo, uh, ca photo cameras sits on the detector. Each detector pixel has a small filter, red, green, or blue filter. This famous Bayer pattern, pattern is printed directly onto the sensor. So that means you get the RGB camera that is for normal photographic applications, great. If you want a very scientific application where other wavelengths are used, you have to create either a new sensor or you have a very complex uh, imaging system with tunable filters, liquid crystal, or other uh, type of technologies that are not portable. It's not like a camera you can carry around. These are lab equipments then. So what happens when you move the filter from here to here is um, in traditional design that doesn't make sense because everything would be integrated if we put the detector here in this one pixel. So you just mess up all the wavelengths into one. But by having a micro lens here, you can actually spread the different wavelengths out behind it. So when you know where to look on the sensor, you can figure out this came from orange, this came from purple. And that way you can reconstruct your spatial spectral images. And here it's very easy to change. So you can swap in and out filters. You can add polarization filters, neutral density filters, etc. in it. So you have a very multimodal architecture. So we saw this architecture coming up and thought, oh, how would we actually go about optimizing these architectures? Because the two uh, publications, they were around a very specific type of prototype that people built. By no means optimized. They're just, just a kind of proof of concept. So our question is how to evaluate, how to optimize, how to characterize performance of these systems. So, and that is uh, here a glance into why this is a different, difficult problem. The design space of such a camera is huge because there are a lot of degrees of freedom suddenly to play with. We have a lot of main lens parameters that people know traditionally. Then we have all the micro lens parameters. I don't want you to read all this, but there's all kinds of diameters, focal lengths, aberrations, etc., wavelengths dependent stuff. We have sensor characteristics. We have object distances that play a role. And then we have data processing parameters. What is my end goal of this imaging? Is it to create a very truthful representation of my scene? Is it a classification performance? Do I consider noise very heavily? So there are a lot of things that uh, go into this model. And so there is a very a big need, I see coming from the signal processing side, a big need for uh, effective sampling technologies for this very high dimensional dynam space. We have to sample kind of the optic space, but we have to sample it in conjunction with the imaging space, with the sensor space. And if we sample really, really densely, the simulations or whatever we do takes forever. It's not practical. So there are ways to approximate things because we know a lot how optics are formed. There is not kind of, you don't need that dense sampling sometimes, but you have to put it all together. And we did some work on this in the past that shows a little bit what room there is to maneuver. I think it's still a very open, open problem from the signal processing side of you. Okay, here a little bit into the optics of this camera. What is interesting about it? So the distortions that are introduced by such a camera are, have the following nature. So this is a camera that has a special filter in the aperture, which is a kind of a Bayer filter pattern but in a ring layout, but we have twice as green than red and blue. So the amount of light that goes through green is twice as much as red and blue. So that is like the Bayer pattern. When we look at the point spread function, which is typically used for characterizing imaging systems, we use it for you know, de-blurring and all this type of thing. At the microlens array plate, there where the microlens uh, array sits, it already looks kind of a little funny. So the, the one here for the red one looks good, kind of nice and sharp. But the other one, because they're rings, they have very different uh, structure already because it's only kind of an annular aperture that you pass light through. So that is one thing we have to consider. Then we have chromatic aberration. So since we pass different wavelengths through, they actually focus on different points. So depending on how good your glass is or what architecture you have, you might have a lot of spread around the, the focal points or less. And then you have problems of where they actually land on the sensors of pixels. You have to, as a race, you have to consider that. And then you have lens aberrations. The main lens are very well corrected these days. So even the cell phone lenses are very well corrected. Aberrations are the 
distortions that the lens introduces, and some of them you just cannot overcome. It's just the nature of glass and the image formation. But by adding more lens elements, you can actually reduce them, and by certain materials of the lens elements. So if we, the normal DSLR cameras are very well corrected, microscopes are very well corrected, even cell phone lenses these days are pretty good. The micro lenses have a bit of a problem because it's a single lens element with certain material. You cannot correct much for that in the optical path. So we consider this as well. And so this is uh, one example where we wanted to uh, evaluate the performance for such an RGB pattern. What do we have to consider? So we have three filters, red, green, blue. And the ratio of this red, green, blue should be 1 to 2 to 1 on the sensor. That means twice as much green as red and blue, like a normal Bayer pattern. And the point spread function, kind of point spread function, on the sensor should be actually an image of the aperture pattern. Because this sensor plane is not looking at imaging the object, it's imaging the pupil plane. So it's imaging the, how we see the object at the pupil plane. So then what we call <laughs> traditionally point spread function actually looks like this. So this is not a normal point spread function the way we, we see this one, right? So, and you see that there are kind of diffraction effects here. And Sapna is our master of this uh, diffraction effect, so you can ask her more about uh, how they come and how they look like. And so you see these kind of rings coming there. So now you, when you overlap them, so there are certain degradations. You have spectral crosstalk. This one comes from red. This one comes from... No, this is red outside. So this one is red. This one is blue. So you see a lot of leakage over from the red to the blue. And uh, so if you then try to take only areas where there's little overlap, we actually have a very big bias on the target distribution. So light blue is a 1 to 2 to 1, and the blue is that you actually get out of it. That has to do just because the lens system introduces distortions. If you have a normal Bayer pattern on the sensor, there is no uh, space, no optics between the filter and the sensor. Here we have the filter out in the aperture with a lot of lens stuff in between, and that creates the degradations that we have to consider. So the question was then, which mask layout is best, and how can we design a best pattern for this? So is it the left, the middle, the right? What is the, the best for kind of a spectral analysis, let's say? So, and we uh, created this, uh, we did wave propagation for all of these patterns, and you see this has the one where the red is, uh, has a lot of, of these diffraction rings here. When you actually move red inside, and the green outside is much better. better. There's not that much of the leakage. And this one is actually very high, nicely concentrated. So this is a kind of combinatorial optimization problem at this stage, because you have to check the different configurations of the patterns. And then we made a cost function that says we evaluate according to the spectral crosstalk, that means how much leak, leakage we have, and the deviation from the target distribution, how much bias we have in this distribution. And we go even one step further and said, given these different given these different patterns, can we actually maybe change this? Maybe we make the, the red here inside, but a little bit smaller. Maybe we get better. Or with the green a little bit wider. So even though this one between these different configurations are combinatorical optimization problems, you can go inside each of these patterns and formulate an optimization problem that is actually not a combinatorical one. So we parameterize these patterns and say we have different segments in this aperture, and each has a parameterization, and then we just set up an optimization problem to figure out which is a better configuration. If we have green outside, red inside, how big of the green, how big, how big should be green, and how big should be red. And so these are the results. So we had certain parameters on the lenses. We considered the F number, and these are all flexible, so we just put one setting. We want to match the micro lens with the F number, uh, the F number with the main lens. We have different focal lengths, very small one, micro lens compared to the main lens. Different diameters, also mag magnet orders of magnitude different. Uh, we pick a reference wavelength, that is where the focal length is defined for. So when we say 50 millimeters, that is according to the specific type of green. And then the material makes a difference, actually. The, the micro lenses are made only, almost all of them are made out of fused silica. You don't have much flexibility there. Whereas the main lens are a combination of fancier glass. And then the last one is a measure on how much optical aberrations do the lenses have, how much optical distortions. So the main lens has very little, the micro lens has more. 
And you see here now, this is uh, the numbers for the non-optimized con configuration. This is for the optimized configuration. So here you see you can actually improve your error that you make in your spectral performance quite a bit when you start adjusting these diameters. And so for this one, it makes a big difference. For this one, it makes a little less difference. For this one, it doesn't make a difference with the type of accuracy and sampling we had in the simulation. Because this is already pretty good, huh? Was there a question? What is that cost function C that you're minimizing? Oh, this is this one. This one. So it's a mixture, a weighted mixture out of the leakage and the deviation from target distribution for now. There are, of course, many other ways you can decide the cost function, but that was went into here. So what was actually a 10% change? Uh, sorry. No, that was 10%. <laughs> we reduced the error from 10% to 6% in, in these ring configurations. Uh -huh. Why does the, the one that's not in the rings, why is it better than the ones that, the ones that are like rings? Yeah, so when you have this, that goes back into here. When you go back into here, you know, the one with the rings creates this diffraction pattern inside. There's a lot of the rings inside, and that penalizes the overlap, the spectral leakage. It has more. When you put this one, the point spread function at the microlens array plane looks very different. I don't have a picture for all of them. For the rings, you see this type of flattering out. If you have the, uh, the more square type of thing, you see not quite as this for all of them, but something that looks more like this for all of the different colors. Yeah, yeah. So then the question is, why would you do the radial pattern, right? So. But it might be also the length of the boundary, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the fraction happens at the boundaries of the yeah. pattern. So, like of the circle, it might be like a really long boundary. Right. Yeah. So there's lots of yeah. There's a lot of possibilities to bend the light here. There are diffraction effects here that, that are kind of not so visible on this display here. So you have diffraction effect here, but they are less severe than here. So why would you choose this one over this? This actually has interesting depth of field problems, P these uh, uh, properties. This type of radial apertures are used to extend depth of field. And so then when you have problems with focusing the microlens array, for example, then you have maybe a bit more variety to actually adjust your microlens to have similar performance than this one, which is very good focus on the microlens array plane, but if you move it away, it's completely out of focus. So this really depends on your over end goal. Mm -hmm. It seems as if there are a couple things you want. Like in color television, the blurring between different um, hues isn't nearly as important as the edge blurring. Uh -huh. Is that the, a kind of effect you either do or could be taking advantage of dealing with human vision and the trade-off between um, grayscale, optim grayscale blurring and color blurring? I don't know the answer to that problem. Because what we see here is not what we see on these pictures I showed are not the end pictures that are not the end information you really need to create your image. There's a lot of digital processing still going on. And so how that digital processing affects this edge on the spatial domain, that I, I don't want to predict at the moment. Okay. So that was a kind of the panoptic architecture where you can make it very kind of flexible by moving things out in the main lens where there are, the tolerance are much bigger, you have more rooms to maneuver. You have to consider that it goes through additional optical system and their degradation, but you can manage them, actually. You can play with them. So from that we go to a different system that is not a panoptic system, where panoptic I see more like a main lens and a micro lens array. This has only small lenses on the chip, so there's no main lens in front of it. The panoptic, uh, the microlens array and the panoptic image really images a kind of the pupil. Here, the, micro, the small lenses really image the scene. So you have multiple views under each lens. And so it's very compact, so it should all sit on one uh, sensor. And what we want is to design such a system that is, has a very high accuracy for depth estimation. And their applications, and so we're working with a development group in Japan, they're designing this type of systems. For example, for inside the passenger car. There are certain controls you want uh, in the car to happen when you can see that a person is sitting in the seat or some other things, or even outside when you open the door. These are not systems that go very far out. They see the, the 
trees in the background of mountains, but very kind of close type of things. So ideally, of course, we want the sticky camera, right? The sticky note camera, the thing on the poster that you kind of stick everywhere. We are not there it's quite there yet. <laughs> so, um, so this is the the trade-offs here is re really size versus accuracy. If we just have two lenses on this, um, on the sensor, so the smaller we make the sensor, the less good I'm in my depth estimation. So that is a trade-off. We cannot make it too small; you lose it. But if we make it bigger, you you get better. But then you know you have a form factor there. So what we uh, did, which is what my uh, Prasanna's work, is to uh, design a kind of uh, multi-aperture design framework and simulation framework to evaluate which of the configurations is best in terms of depth performance. And this system works as follows. We have a lot of input specifications that have to do, again, sensor, optics, calibration object. What do I have in front of you that I calibrate my camera on? Uh, certain algorithms are used for matching different views and uh, 3D coordinates, etc. And then we have a, a multi-aperture configuration generator. That says it, it checks different configurations of putting different lenses together. And for each of these co configurations, we evaluate how an image would look like when I look through this configuration. So we really have a simulation of what these lenses see. And this uh, includes diffraction effects, aberrations, distortions, noise, quantization. So it has a full optical and a sensor model on top of this. And then we estimate how good the quality in terms of depth is. So the depth metrics that, uh, that are used, cost functions. We do a Monte Carlo run to estimate different, uh, to check the noise performance of the systems. And uh, so then we figure out which one is the best configuration that we have. And so there's iteration, of course, you know, you choose different configurations, then you run the whole process and you check the next one. And at the end, you figure out which one is actually the best. So here is uh, some uh, design constraints that we give. So the sensor size should be fixed. Everything has to fit onto the sensor. We, the lenses will not overlap. And they have the same field of view and uh, the same minimal cell size. Minimal cell size. So these are now lenslets that are manufactured individually. They're not on an array. right? These are really tiny individual lenses. And they can be made up to... What are 500 microns? Maybe such a thing. So micro lens array lenses can be made smaller, but they sit together on an array. And then we have to consider lens packing. Spherical lenses only, or are you considering spherical. prisms or no. cylinders? For this one, it's only spherical lenses. So here, uh, lens packing. So do we do we pack it like this, or do we pack it like a checkerboard? Uh huh. Um, so in your um, lens evaluation. Uh -huh. that the median between the object and your image plane, um, not the image plane, but the front aperture of your optical system is, is of a constant refractive index? Because for instance, if you take the bullseye pattern and you put it at the bottom of a swimming pool. Oh yeah, no, we, we don't have this situation. I don't think so, right? Yeah, yeah. at the moment it's just no. fair. Yeah. So you're, you're assuming n equals one for all distances between objects Yes, and yes, yeah, aperture. yeah. Yeah. So that seems to kind of present a problem for the depth estimation then, because if you if you kind of construct a really artificial object with the same bullseye pattern, but with each individual layer of of the different colors are at different depths. But if n equals one between the object mm -hmm. and the front aperture, well, there's real depth information there, and you're going to get a different focus if you focus at different layers of the object. But if you put the exact same object but now collapse all the different colors into the same depth and if you put it behind a medium that has chromatic aberration then you're going to get different yeah. focus yeah. for yeah. different layers yeah. but it's not because it's at different depths. Yeah. So how do you disassemble with that? We, we, don't have a, we don't have the situation where we have a different medium. We have always air between the lens and the object. So these are really applications where you put it like in the car passenger seat or so. It's not a specific like where you image through certain other medium. So refractive index is always n equal one. I assume the same applies for monochromatic aberrations as well, because yeah. if, if your rays are skewed as a consequence of 
the aberrations of air, you would still have to assume that the spot pattern on your image plane at your sensor level was generated due to the uh, due to the actual rays emerging from the object as opposed to the rays being bent by refractive index in between the object and your yeah. aperture. Yeah. Let's see, Prasanna made some video here. You see the optical, optimal packing. So that is uh, research we took from the literature. What is an optical packing for a certain fixed area? And for one, two, I don't know, 60 lenses or something like this, there, there's research that says what is optimal packing. And so that we tried this, and we tried the checkerboard, the kind of simple to manufacture case. Yeah, yeah, that is very geometric, uh, only geometric uh, criteria here, which is a good point. We discussed this, if that is a, but that is the one we use at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why are you restricted to identical lens sizes? Why can't you have some smaller lenses and some uh, You can. There's only that next step. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Theoretically, we could optimize for all this. It's just a matter of making the program more flexible running it again. So, yeah, this, the framework is set up that you can actually do this. So now we simulate this uh, multi multiple aperture images. You see one from a stereo configuration where we see a checkerboard image, the, the cross of a checkerboard image, and you see some noise and this gray is some blur that comes around the edges. And then for the uh, multiple lens configuration, you see that kind of very low resolution image you see where the noise is much more prom prominent here. So what we, uh, the model we assume of Prasanna implemented is a thick lens imaging model. So it has distortion and diffraction effects in it, aberration. Uh, it estimates subpixel positioning and has a, some kind of detection algorithm in it. And the lens design actually comes from ZMAX. So we do a lot with real optical design software. So we have ZMAX running where we get some kind of lens design and all parameters we want about the optics. And then we usually interface with MATLAB with that to uh, play with this. Uh, either get more information from ZMAX or just take that and then process it further. So here's a quality estimation. We get multiple images. And we tried, in the first step, we tried to figure out the displacement of each of the images from the ideal object, where we know, because it's simulation, we know where we put our original object. And then we do a sign of subpixel estimator with some kind of centroid method. And then we have the different positions, and we do a kind of a least square solution. And then we actually put a, a kind of a, error on this, because there's a noise model in it, and we have to simulate different realizations of this noise. And that is done with some Monte Carlo method. So we get like 100 runs or so of different noisy images. And then we figure out how that affects our depth accuracy. And so there's some uh, closed form solution for this. The input images here are random dot patterns? No, these are checkerboard. Okay. So for this one, we have checkerboard. We have another one that is some kind of more randomized. I don't know, but it's, it's flexible, but that was one that was actually used by our colleagues in Japan. So. so you can put your own things in it. You can put your own kind of estimation algorithm if you have a different one in, or you can put your own object in. Mm -hmm. You can also play with your own cost functions, right? So this is an L2 solution. If you want to some, more, some other fancy stuff or regularize something, you can do that. So again, the design constraints, uh, we go to the results section now. So we have a constant field of view uh, with a constant F number. So all the lenses are, have the same F number. And uh, um, the distance, that we said, the distances, lens sensor, identical lens sensor, distance, oh yeah. So this distance is also not changed. So that is kind of fixed on one plane. And then the individual lenses, we let vary the diameter, but they all varies in the same way. So they all have the same size. So that is when we simulate Poisson noise for the sensor. So we have two different sensor models, one that is uh, Poisson noise and one that is Gaussian noise. So here you have uh, the stereo case where you say, what error do I have in my depth estimation when I have all the degradations through lenses and through the sensor in, in the model? So you have a certain number here. And then when it goes for multiple configuration, you actually find that with a larger amount of lenses, you get a better depth estimation. Um, so you increase the error in the depth estimation. 
So the question is, why does it happen, and do we have an intuition of why it happens? How can we explain that? And one is you just have multiple views of the same object, and that helps you in the depth estimation. Once you go further on, there are limits that you, it just doesn't make any sense. There's too much noise in the system. The manufacturer aberrations get too dominant in the system. So there is some, and then we talked a lot about why it is wiggly, why it is not a kind of uniform curve. And the wiggliness has different explanation. One is, Hassan, help me out. One is a packing that is not, when we do this optimal packing, we don't have the same amount of, or we don't have a control over the black space here that is, uh, where the black space is. So here we have the optimal packing here, and for three lenses it will look very differently. So the position of the lenses change in each of the configuration okay. quite a bit. There was one other, uh, I think the second one that we yeah, had. Right? So the first is that the, the number of, of pixels that is actually being consumed in each of these different lens configurations is not a monotonous function. Okay. And number two, yeah. as you go from one lens configuration to another, your lenses change in a very different way that they start seeing very different views. So uh, those are two reasons that we think that contribute to the uh, wiggly shape. But, um, but to what extent is it due to just how much, how many pixels are covered? I mean, if you if you relax, if, if you have the lenses a little bit smaller so you can wiggle them around a little bit, would you be able to get lower yet without being packed? Like it, uh, these are all like optimized so that the lenses are as big as they can be and packed in, right? If you go a little bit smaller and you wiggle them around, yeah. you get a you get a win. I mean, maybe you can lower it. Right? That's a very interesting question. So uh, in that case, what happens is you're not really using the full potential of the sensor. Because you're making the lenses smaller, right. which means that you're really uh, affecting the resolution capability of the lenses, so which contributes to more disparity estimation error, so you, the depth error increases. So what we figured was that um, having the lenses bigger um, uses more of the sensor area, but we don't have a theoretical proof to say that optimal geometric packing relates to the lowest depth error, but that is what we've been observing so far. Can you optimize with respect to like you have to follow lines? Yeah, you can do all kinds of different. And, and like, I think it's an interesting question. What is the real right measure yeah. for your optimization? We talked about what is the kind of capacity of the sensor for this type of application. If we find some kind of abstract definition, that's out for grasp. We don't have an answer to that. The most exciting thing to me on that graph is the almost factor of three drops from 15 lenses down to 17. <laughs> where there's almost no change in lens size, it must be mostly a change in the arrangement. Yeah. Is it the regularity versus the irregularity? I mean, five by three looks like a checker, like a grid, and the others are probably weird. I don't know, what happened? Exactly, uh, the lens, uh, you know, the lens, I mean, this is optimal packing, right? There's no systematic way in which the position of the lens has changed. So in, in that case, the biggest drop is because of the fact that when you go from one configuration to another, the second configuration starts looking at the object in a totally different way. And that, that is the explanation. Uh, Compressed so sensing or something. It's sort of a, a, a more robust, irregular representation. Somehow. Absolutely. It also has to do with what kind of parallax we are uh, taking advantage of. And some configurations take uh, both horizontal and vertical parallax, and, and that together reduces our depth error, and some don't take advantage. Lots of questions to open. Once you have this optimization framework somewhere in place, you have actually a lot of opportunities to kind of run different configurations. Right? So this is an example of a Gaussian noise where you see it looks actually quite different. So we have a much smaller number of lenses. It seemed to be the optimal number here. And that has to do with some kind of, uh, maybe Prasanna has the best explanation of why Poisson and Gaussian. You had yesterday a good explanation. What, why the Gaussian is pushes, pushes it to the left really, side? That's a very interesting question. The, the reason why we were considering Poisson and Gaussian is basically because of there, there are different kinds of sensors you know, that are affected by different kinds of noise. Uh, in the Poisson model, we were considering the shock noise, meaning that the noise is coming from the photon itself. On the other hand, in the Gaussian model, we have more dark current and other noise effects coming in, even if you do not have a photon. Um, and so in that case, you have a lot more contribution from the background and even in, from pixels where you do not have photons. So in general, Gaussian noise is more, uh, is bad, is worse than Poisson. In, in our case, that means that as you go for more and more lenses, the noise effects, uh, you know, start mm -hmm. kicking in more. 
and that is the reason why the optimal uh, lens configuration for Gaussian is much smaller than uh, what we had in this one. Is this fixed Gaussian lens? Yes, it's fixed Gaussian lens. So it's independent of, of amount of light? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that said, uh, we, we wanted to individually evaluate the effect of shot, uh, um, shot noise and uh, Gaussian, but any of these other configurations are also, can also be addressed in this model. So here is a, of course, we, we don't get anything for free, right? So we said we can in, in, uh, increase the accuracy of, stereo es uh, of depth estimation from stereo to more lenses. But what, what, does a, what does a price we pay? The price we pay is kind of a spatial traversal resolution loss. So we see here what is a minimal resolvable spot size in the object plane for these different lens configurations. So that becomes bigger and bigger. That means... The, the spot that I can actually resolve is bigger and bigger in the object. I cannot distinguish two very narrow spots with all these multiple lens configurations. So even though we get better Z dimension accuracy, we lose in the X, Y dimension. But this is a trade-off we always face in the systems, right? We, know, we not get anything, everything for free. There are always trade-offs. So that was kind of the two uh, multi-view system architectures we designed and optimized and studied. And I just want to throw up some open questions that I think up for grabs or that we would like to study in the future. So our uh, very central is a cost metric. We talked about evaluation metrics a lot. What is really the system performance metrics that we use? And we use for the panoptics that we use spectral crosstalk, spectral distribution approximation. We use depth for the uh, multiple camera. We use a lot of optical metrics that we have a handle on, the just pure optical metrics. And then what about the image reconstruction models after that? So we showed you some kind of optical part of it. So now what is really when people want to look at images? So combining multiple use, multiple scenes into one rendering, can we include that into some kind of design framework? Uh, when you think about image reconstruction, you can look for fidelity. You can look for kind of smoothness and go away from maybe some fidelity, noise perception, you know, even though you want to get rid of all the noise, the images don't look good, people don't like them, you add some noise back in, this kind of effects. And the visual perception of certain something came up already, we have not addressed in the design. Um, the trade-offs between different modalities of light, suddenly we have ways of sampling the planoptic function in a very flexible way. We can do spatial coordinates, depths, wavelengths, polarization, all these things. So what are good, uh, how do we manage the trade-offs? Can we get a good representation that lets that manage the trade-offs easy? And if you're for the signal processing people, if you think about the basis function, you know, what is a good basis representation for this type of light that we capture? Uh, dynamic range is something we can play with, and all needs efficient implementation. So the optimization sometimes runs really long, um, because there's in the optical parts, a lot of Fourier optics goes into certain parts of the simulation, and there's a lot of Nyquist sampling and this type of sampling going on. And then, you know, optimization runs several times. The Monte Carlo is in place with extra 100 runs just to create the different noise configurations, etc. So we, of course, want in the future for not just the design, but also the real processing to target mobile platforms. So that's, of course, a big uh, target for us, too. So if you think about GPU processing or related stuff, what can we, how can we structure this kind of multi-view processing that we need? to be efficient. So this is kind of the open questions I just throw out. We did a lot on the optics parts. We, we have to move to the image processing part now. And I will go quickly in the PC, in the 3D office. That's just uh, kind of three slides. So we started this summer a little bit uh, intro into uh, stereoscopic 3D. So it's a kind of simplest version of multi-view. <laughs> but not from the capture side. This is really from the perceiving side for the user. And so the question we asked is, what if people bring these toys into the office and actually want to show uh, material that was created with this type of cameras or some other related cameras in, in a conference uh, setting as a presentation? So this is the Fuji stereo camera here. So uh, how can we prepare Rigo for such a scenario? What do we have to I investigate? What, I mean, it was just a learning phase, basically. What are the problems that come with this? And so we uh, started out looking at our conference room. And our conference room, and Ivana knows how this seating, special seating are there, habits. Are there better chairs for the Japanese visitors? Or <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but it's really the dynamic is interesting with this conference room. The chairs are not different, but it's definitely the seating arrangement. It's really funny. 
And it's not that we force somebody to sit somewhere, right? It comes naturally. It's kind of, Bill knows it really, well. it's a kind of a self, what is it called? Self-organizing. Yeah, self-organizing, like the cellular automata, you know, it kind of creates its own thing. So what we have here is usually people come in here, and then there's a big table here, and there's usually the projector goes on here. Here's a, a whiteboard or smart board, and there are a lot of tables, around, uh, chairs around here, and then there are chairs in the back. And so when you see from, from this side here, you see the chairs in the back. On this side of the room, there's other equipment. We have conference room, uh, LCD displays, and here you see, actually here there was a video camera standing because of some experiment. We have other cameras in the room, etc. So now what happens is the presenter is usually here. Um, the visitors sit around the table, and maybe the leader of the meeting sits around the table. So funny case, normal visitors who come in general sit often here. But when our Japanese uh, bosses come for review, they always sit on this side. So it's kind of funny. But, so they sit on different sides of the table, but they always occupy these first three chairs. And then usually the other visitors sit more around this time. And the research crowd, the general audience, gathers in the back. So that is not because you want to hide. It's more that you cannot really see when there's suddenly somebody sitting here. You cannot see the projection surface very well. So with this configuration, what do we do with 3D? So where do we put it? How do we put it? How do we render it? So that maybe certain people can see very well. Um, nobody should be fatigued, but we want maybe our bosses to be, have a really good impression of this material. So that was kind of the thing we started out looking at. And the challenge is really that this is not very uniform environment, not very controlled. It's like in a cinema that is created that everybody sits in a certain place and illumination is controlled. Here we have lots of different viewing distance and angles and illumination settings. Sometimes people dim the, the front lights and then somebody wants to see in the back they put on these special lights. And then there are a lot of interaction between displays actually. You know, people have their own. Everybody brings smartphones these days to the meetings, right? Because you get distracted, you do something here and, and tablets. And then we have the video conferencing uh, panels, and we have a smart board and everything. So we did an initial investigation. We did a user study. We did some content that was not professionally created that came from some database that has stereoscopic images, and we put it on a 3D TV, and we asked people about their viewing experience in different parts of the room. So we wanted to create kind of a heat map for this room. So where is a good place, or how should we configure the room? That was kind of the dream. Of course, it's a difficult problem, and we, we made a little bit of progress. So basically, uh, uh, the scene, yeah, so I talked, the scenes were created with something like this, so that was not a movie that we showed, still image scenes. And the feedback was really that nobody liked it. I mean, nobody could deal with this kind of material for a longer time. So th this, for, for a presentation that often lasts an hour, you know, people really get fatigued after a certain, like 20 minutes or so. And then we have a lot of complaints about not being able to fuse. And so certain things where we were able to do the fusing and certain areas in the back. I had horrible problems when there was any indoor scene where light came through the back and there was a lot of high dynamic range content, like illumination stuff and so I had a hard time fusing that one. And then some people just cannot perceive stereoscopic 3D. So if then they are in the presentation, they're supposed to see certain effects, they just can't, right? So it's not a, in, a, in a cinema you have the choice. If you know that you cannot see 3D, you might not go. But here, if somebody brings the stuff in the office, everybody sits there, right? You cannot just say, I go out for now. So these are all kind of problems that also have to be a little bit in this conference setting specific. So there are a lot of open questions. It's just the starting point to look into the space. And uh, now we start doing you know, some more research on this. So that was for the kind of uh, stereoscopic 3D vision crowd here in the, in the um, audience. So conclusion, what we know is we actually know very well how to model these optical digital components on the capture side. Um, we can do performance optimization, and we show that we actually get improvement. Um, current performance metrics focus more on kind of computer vision type of metrics, the depth maps and the uh, uh, analysis metrics like spectral performance. Um, we can actually design and prototype these systems. We have a group in Japan that actually builds prototypes. So all this handling of micro-optic sensor is possible these days. And uh, so we develop a lot of optimization techniques that require simulation and really good models that have to do realistic and fast that calls for kind of theoretical approximation results in this space that are still missing. 
what we have not done, we have not included the human perception into these models. And we have not done so much on working on applying our knowledge onto the display side of things. We worked a lot in the capture side in the past. Uh, so we did a little 3D uh, investigation into our conference room equipment. To actually, I think we came up with a bunch of further research questions that we want to address by doing this initial investigation. So with that, I want to uh, finish a little bit with a small advertisement that we actually uh, could acquire some more money for resources for our lab, and we have open positions there that uh, need to be filled in the near upcoming future. So in case anybody's interested or knows somebody who's interested, we have open positions in visual processing, that is kind of our area, human-computer interaction, connected object technologies, that is more kind of the non-optical sensors, RFID-related stuff. Um, it's kind of cross-group collaboration, so it's not that it's only one particular niche there. So, but, but we have openings there if somebody is interested. We also offer internships. Last year, uh, we were not quite ready for the 3D internship. We just were learning, and there were lots of issues where we could do it only a certain type of internship. I think next week we are, uh, next year we are uh, much more in a better place to do internships around the 3D vision stuff. We did also internships on the camera design work. So, so that is always a good opportunity to come for three months in the summer. If you want more information, there is our website. You can always email me also on, our, on my website. I try to list the more recent publications if you're interested in. So anyways, if you want any more information, you can ask either one of us. We're happy to give as much as we can. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Emily. Uh -huh. system that you were talking about. I was just curious, do the, um, does the sensor always have to be a plane? Or do people ever make, can you make a sensor where like each element is at a different, like yeah. if it was ridged or yeah. something? So there has been some work on trying to make sensors that are on curved surfaces mm -hmm. because that's much more natural for the optical, for the lens part of it because it always has some distortions to the side. That is not ready for prime time, this technology. So people are, it's in research but it's not usable. There are people who work on this uh, huge DARPA project on the gigapixel cameras, and they put like huge, I think the optics is really big, and then they put lots of different sensors, like different cameras, and they have different positions and different uh, distances. But then it's individual sensors that you place. It's kind of a big system. On the compact side, it's not possible at the moment, even though we would love this. Right? We would love to have another degree of freedom to play with it, but the, the research is not, it's not ready for any industrial application. I wasn't clear. You, you said you wanted to um, do some human perception metrics mm -hmm. with respect to the Lenoptic camera project and, and the um, and the Mold Quiet mm -hmm. project. What what, what what did you have in mind? What what things are you worried about? So for the um, for the multi view uh, for the system on the chip multi view, we have, for example, that every lens has the same focal length, right? So we, we know from also your work and some other people's work that people focus on different places and they, the depth has different characters at different focal distances. So one idea was if you, we really have complete control over it, maybe we can design lenses with different focal lengths that lets you help somehow have a better depth perception of objects and combine the information in some way. I don't know what the answer is. How are you imagining displaying the information to get out of the camera? We, we see. Oh, yeah. okay. We have not done, uh, this is all up for the future. So I think we have a handle to capture the different modalities of light and a lot of degrees of freedom. Currently, it's all applied to computer vision type of algorithms. If we think about, you know, we know extended depth of field blur. We can control this with the lenses. We can make special lenses with special focus blur, mm -hmm. right? Can we use all this knowledge that we have? to address the per human perception parts a little bit. There's, of course, lots of color thing going on for the human perception as well. So if we really want pe people to look at uh, spectrally f nice, uh, with good fidelity pictures, maybe we want to do some different metrics. There's talking about, for example, medical applications in telemedicine, 
where you want to transmit certain like dermatology pictures or so, then rendering is really, really important so that people can look at it and it looks natural to them. So these, these things we all have not considered. It's kind of pure on a kind of signal processing information theory computer vision basis at the moment. Yes? I was curious to know how the quality of your lens, those smaller lenses oh. are when they are off axis. Oh, good question. So that actually depends a lot for the planoptic. Uh, for the planoptic camera architecture, it depends on your main lens design. You can design main lenses that they have very little distortion of axis and then basically comes in parallel onto every point on the sensor. For the multi-view other one, that is you have, yes, distortions across the field of view and Prasanna incorporates that into his uh, model. Actually, that comes out of the ZMAX file and into the optical design software, you get information of how uh, the degradation is across the field of view, and you can take this into account. I was wondering that if the degradation is more as you mm. go to eccentricity, and if the achromatic axis of the lens slit is not well matched with the achromatic axis of your front lens, I was wondering if that leads to transverse chromatic aberration, which could give you a false depth estimate where real depth information doesn't exist because your yes. different colors are going to be off to yeah. To a yeah. Sensor. Yes. And so, so what, what sometimes people do is between the lenses they put like barriers, shade walls, so that you eliminate this type of crosstalk. If you know exactly what your crosstalk is or this kind of shearing around, you might actually take advantage of this. By knowing, what the By knowing exactly where things go. So, so what happens in all these uh, architectures is if you have this over over crosstalk of some way, you have what called a multiplexing on the sensor. You get from different types of information to one sensor measurement. Um, in certain conditions, there are methods for demultiplexing this. That depends a lot on certain other configurations, how far you can push that. But one of that people do is they put either like chrome apertures, for example, onto the little lenslets to block out certain of the crosstalk on the lenslet uh, plane, or they build like shade barriers behind uh, the lens lit array between the different lenses to avoid that it leaks over into different things. So there are, there are all kinds of manufacturing techniques that you can do. For the refocusing, you actually want the leakage. For the digital refocusing, you want that the uh, light goes onto different areas of the sensor. If you know exactly where it goes, there are ways to take advantage of it. Of course, there are limitations. You can only do it in a certain range. If it gets too severe, you know, it doesn't help you anymore. Yeah, Ivan. Has anyone tried to do uh, catheter devices using the micro lens arrays, like to put the mirror to achieve a very wide field of view? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. The only thing that I know this gigapixel camera people, they try to do that, but with a very big apparatus, right? They put individual cameras instead of micro lenses. So that all doesn't apply to micro optics. They do a very large scale. It looks like the first Stanford picture where they have more view was this array of cameras, right? This gigapixel thing is like huge. To what extent do you think, uh, it sounds like you guys are targeting I don't exactly know the status of their technology, but of course, Sapna is an expert in all kind of retinal imaging <laughs> things. So, yeah, yeah. But I don't know exactly what their system does. It's a regular fungus camera. A regular fungus camera. Yeah. I think they're in Oakland with something. I think they heard them at the Bay Area to do some. Yeah, a cheap adaptive and optics, different. yeah. But I wanted to say with Mari's idea hmm? with the fungus camera, that would require you to know the dispersion of the subject's eye. Hmm. Because now you have a whole new set of a compound optic system in the part of your of of your clean optic camera. So the rays are going to be skewed both by your camera lens as well as the person's eye. Mm -hmm. In order for you to know where the ray is actually being generated from different depths, you will need to know what's happening in the yeah. optical part. Yeah. So it all depends on how detailed and accurate an image you want. Yeah. If you want just a social image, just want to have a look at some of the autoblurred things you want to take. 
something normal image with another filter. Okay, then you select, then you can basically go. It depends on how accurate you want. If you want really, really accurate for maybe uh, just out of the resins, then you can optimize the resin. So it entirely depends on the application. Exactly. I think it is possible to do it accurately uh, by using waveform sensors in combination with technology like this. So with waveform sensors like a simple Shankar Smith sensor, you can measure the aberrations and compensate for that to a good degree. But of course, you know, we are not pushing it that far yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. You have an input sensor in your camera already. Exactly. So you are already doing zonal estimation using the centroid. So you could measure the aberrations of a person's eye simply with your camera. But you need to have like a source of light yeah. as opposed to an extended option mm -hmm. with a lot of light. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank okay. you. Thank you.